with Pastor Otabel, our interactive discussion program that brings scriptural perspective to the contemporary issues that engage you and I on a daily basis. This also serves as our Tuesday service here at Christ Temple. So on behalf of Dr. and Mrs. Otabel, let me say a big thank you to you for tuning in or logging on to this broadcast. The week starting from the triumphant entry of Christ into Jerusalem all the way through till his crucifixion and his burial is referred to as the Passion Week. Do you want to understand the scriptural significance of some of the major events that occurred that week? We are blessed to have with us once again the General Overseer of the International Central Gospel Church, Pastor Mensa Otabu. Pastor, welcome to this program. Thank you. Let me also introduce my co-panelist, Pastor Patrick Kujo, who will be helping us to ask some of these critical questions. Pastor Patrick, good to see you. Good to see you too. Let's start with our viewers, and if someone is watching and their loved ones are not watching, what should they do? So if you're watching us online um, on any of our digital media platforms, this is what we always encourage you to do, to share this experience. So share this experience with your friends, with your family, with all your loved ones. And if you're on Facebook, create a watch party. We want this broadcast to be a blessing to many people out there. So share this link now. Right. So let's get a discussion underway. Pastor Table, in the book of Matthew 16, right after Peter's great declaration of Jesus as a Christ, Jesus carefully documented how he would die. Now, did he have to die? And if he had to die, did he have to be on the cross? Well, the, the death of Jesus Christ is, was central to his mission. Uh, you would say, in a sense, that he came to die. Right. Uh, and so death was not a surprise to him, and neither was it uh, a discomfort to him. Jesus stated often and frequently that he was going to die. In fact, from his birth, the prophecy was that his birth would cause pain and sorrow to his mother, Mary. So the, the concept of the Messiah dying or Christ dying was present right from the beginning of his life uh, through to his ministry. And he kept announcing it uh, often uh, that this was what he came to do. Uh, some have tried to see the death of Jesus Christ as an act of uh, jealous people, uh, as an act of uh, insecure, powerful people. That may have been part of what played into it. But his death was the reason he came. And because his death was answering to something very deep in, in the story of mankind, right from the Garden of, Adam, uh, of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, uh, God said that the day you eat of this, you shall surely die. Uh, we all know that they didn't immediately die physically. Judgment was postponed. Instead of it being on Adam, Christ came to bear that judgment and, and to satisfy the just requirements for the redemption of mankind from the consequences of the fall of, of mankind in the Garden of Eden, the sin of Adam and Eve. So death was very, very central to the mission of Christ. Let's pick out the means. Did it have to be the cross? Anytime you picture the actual crucifixion, it, it comes across as very brutal. Did it have to be the cross? The, the cross was important in several ways uh, because the the, the the death of Jesus Christ had to satisfy something. It had to meet a certain requirement. Uh, in Jewish thinking, uh, the cross was a symbol of a curse. And, and the Jewish scripture says that a per person who died on the cross or on a tree was cursed. Um, and so if Jesus was taking on the curse of the whole world on himself, then the the cross symbolized that he had come to lift the curse that is supposed to be on human beings on himself. And that required that he died uh, that very painful and very difficult death. Uh, crucifixion was not invented for Jesus. 
uh, historically, crucifixion was a means by which the Phoenicians uh, would uh, punish people. Uh, eventually, different empires developed it, and the Romans perfected it as a means for punishing dissents, dissidents, and enemies. Uh, and, and they did it in a very gruesome, painful way so that a person would suffer the consequences. It was that death that Jesus ch chose. And Jesus Christ himself said he was going to die on a cross. I mean, he wasn't going to die by being beheaded like John the Baptist. He wasn't going to be stabbed. He wasn't going to die in a shipwreck. He wasn't going to die natural causes from a disease. He was going to die a particular death the death on the cross, which seemed like a very shameful, cursed way to, to die, but it was purposefully taken so that he would take our curse upon himself. I, I, I like the description, born to die. It almost sounds like the title of a film, but it really <laughs> captures the whole essence of purpose. Pastor Patrick. Look, I, I want to ride on your um, statement about the cross being a symbol of shame and ridicule. So in the Jewish culture, we realized that the death was a painful death. It was humiliating. It was a penalty for a crime committed. But in Christian times, it's, it's, it's a symbol that represents the faith. We preach God's love, God's peace, joy in the Holy Ghost and all that. How does one reconcile the two? Uh, the, the cross transitioned from a symbol of uh, punishment or execution to become a symbol of faith. Not because the Romans changed the usage of the cross or the Phoenicians changed the usage of the cross, but one day uh, a particular person died on one of these crosses and changed the purpose of the, of the cross. Of course, the Romans still used the cross uh, to, to execute people, but what was supposed to be the shame of the world was triumphed over by Christ. And the reason why the cross became the symbol of Christianity was not only that uh, Christ died on it, but that he resurrected from death. It was the resurrection that gives us victory over death. So all of a sudden, uh, what was supposed to be a punishment is no longer a punishment. What is supposed to be shame is no longer a shame. What is supposed to be a disgrace is no longer a disgrace. So for Christians, when we look back at the cross, we see how Christ triumphed over it and gave us life. And, and we own the cross now as a symbol of the triumph of Christ over death and over, over the sin of Adam, which he came to rectify. Okay. So in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, the mm -hmm. Bible says that for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but for us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, in this scripture, what was Apostle Paul referring to by the message of the cross? Uh, the, 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 the Apostle Paul was speaking to the Corinthian Christians. The Corinthian Christians were a mixture of two kinds of people. They were Jews who had become Christians, and then there were Greeks, non-Jews, who had also become Christians. And, and G, uh, Paul is addressing them about the centrality, the, the cross of Christ, and how it is central to the Christian faith. And he says, when a Jew looks at the cross, it's a symbol of a curse. And so to say that the Savior of the world died on the cross doesn't make sense to a Jew. It's a stumbling block to him because how can the Savior at the same time be cursed? The Jew, the, the, the Greeks uh, see the cross as a, a humiliating thing and in Greek, Greek mythology, if you studied Greek mythology, uh, it is about superheroes, Hercules. It's about all these heroes who are larger than life. And for Christians then to claim that their savior died on the cross doesn't make sense to a Greek mind. It, it's, it doesn't make intellectual sense. Uh, and so for people who are just looking at it from an intellectual point of view, the cross doesn't make sense. For those who are looking at it from a traditional point of view, the cross doesn't make sense. And, and for me, that is the beauty of Christianity. 
and, and that the authenticity of Christianity. If the disciples of Jesus were inventing a message to convince the world about a carpenter from Nazareth, whom they now claim is uh, a messiah, they would not invent a story that includes crucifixion. Mm -hmm. They would have invented something more noble. They would have invented something more pleasing to the Jews, more pleasing to the Greeks. But they, they knew the historical fact that Jesus died on the cross and he rose again. So they could speak that message with a lot of conviction. And, and really they died for it uh, because they knew that the cross was what made all the difference. Although in the culture they lived in, it wasn't the most reasonable, logical argument to give. And for me, that is even a deeper reason for me to believe their testimony because they chose the most unlikely to tell their story. It wasn't a hero. It wasn't a superhero. It was a factual, historical Christ who died on the cross to the Jews, a curse, to the Greeks, a foolish death. But to us who believe Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And that's why we celebrate Christ, uh, because of the authenticity of his, of his death. He died actually, and he died in a remarkable way to save us from sin. I like the way you bring these points home with the balance of the, the theology brings historical perspective and then the analysis of it. It, it brings the point home very strongly. Isaiah seems to have a special significance in terms of being able to predict the, the details of the Messiah and, and everything related to him. And in Isaiah 53, it talks about the fact that by his tribes we were healed. What does that, that mean within the context of a world battling with, with a challenging uh, physical condition, a virus, um, a world looking for healing? What does it mean when the Bible says by his tribes we were healed? Well, you know, the, the life of Jesus was scripted by God. In other words, Jesus didn't just come to live a life. He came to fulfill prophecy. And so when you read the scriptures, especially the Gospel of St. Matthew, you will read the phrase that it might be fulfilled, which was written by the prophets. Um, and, and the apostles who were putting together the story of Christ. We're mindful of how the life of Jesus Christ wasn't just sporadic. He wasn't just living his life, but they could see a method that all of this was fulfilling something that had been written. And, and so when Jesus had to be whipped, it wasn't a choice the Romans made as to whether to whip him or not to whip him. They, they were compelled to whip him because the scriptures had declared that he had to be whipped. Uh, ordinarily, if he was going to be crucified, why don't you just go and crucify him? But they had to whip him, put stripes on his back because the prophet Isaiah had already prophesied that by that thing happening, we were going to receive healing from God. And so the Romans themselves were fulfilling scripture just as Christ was living out scripture. And the purpose of that uh, is for our healing. Now, why is it for our healing? Because when your back is beating, and, and, and what was used to beat the back of Jesus wasn't a cane as we know it. It was uh, what is called the cat -on -night tails, uh, which has spikes at the edge. So it, it doesn't just hit the spikes skin it breaks the skin it tears it off and so in in the stripes of jesus his skin is broken and why is his skin broken because god wants to mend our skin god wants to mend our bodies god wants to put our bodies together he paid the price by getting his body to be broken so that our bodies if they ever get broken can be put together again and that is why we believe in the power of healing healing power is not in the pastor it's not in me it's not in anybody none of us have any healing power it is the stripes of jesus that purchases the healing and all that we do is take recognition of it claim it to be so and receive it and 
and we do it by an act of faith and and he doesn't break us he mends us he makes us whole and so for people going through this um, crisis uh, that is breaking our bodies and breaking lungs and uh, respiratory systems and 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 killing people th there is a point of convergence in our faith where we have to believe that the stripes of Jesus were n are not just efficient to heal headaches uh, uh, or, or other diseases but also a new one and, and a new virus that is appearing was anticipated yeah. in the in the stripes of Jesus and there is healing in, in the in the in the in the sacrifice of Christ and I just want to pray for anyone who is watching who feels broken or, or probably you've been infected by something else whatever sickness it is and I pray the healing power of Christ will touch you wherever you are and receive it trust in him to put your body together and make you whole Amen. So this, this breaking of the body that you describe is there a relationship between that and the communion the breaking of the bread the breaking of the body is there a connection the, the brokenness of Jesus Christ um, was very important for our salvation at all levels for for the salvation of our of our from sin from sickness from demonic harassment uh, the, the Bible says the chastisement Isaiah prophesied the chastisement of our peace was upon him in other words when he was being chastised and somebody would say what is chastised it's when they they were mistreating Jesus they would slap him and ask him who's who is slapping you almost to disorient him to mentally disorient him it was that chastisement and he had to go through that mental torture so God can give us a sound mind and, and clothe our minds with sanity. Uh, and so when we are depressed or distressed about something, his chastisement makes us whole. So he was, his back was broken, but his whole body was broken so that every part of our lives can be put together. Uh, whether it's our mind, our spiritual life, our physical lives, even our financial life. Uh, he can put our lives together wherever our life is broken Jesus suffered total brokenness even spiritual brokenness when he hung on the cross and repeated the, the words of Psalm 22 my God my God why has thou forsaken me that's that's spiritual disorientation spiritual brokenness so that we can be reconciled to God as father and know him and, and live for him if you just joined us, this is a very insightful discussion that brings scriptural perspectives to some of the major incidents that have occurred in the history of mankind, focusing particularly on the Passion Week between the triumphant entry and the death and the resurrection of Christ. What we are getting our pastor to do is to give us the understanding of the scriptural relevance of some of the incidents on the way to the cross and beyond. And I'm getting some very useful perspectives that can help me situate everything within the context of God's plan for mankind. The one thing I've learned, born today. First Patrick, very insightful. Image. Very, very insightful. Look, on the night of Jesus' passion, he goes to Gethsemane to pray. Um, Luke chapter 22, verse 42 talks about Jesus' prayer and at a point he prays that, Father, if it is your will, take this, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Anytime I read this scripture, I, I begin to think that Jesus was having a second, you know, thought. Was it this? Was this so? The story of man is told in two gardens. The Garden of Eden, the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Eden is Adam who chose his own will against the will of God and, and did what was wrong and got expelled from Eden. The Garden of Gethsemane is where Christ, sort of also in a garden, in the same position as Adam, having to decide whether to choose his will, as Adam did, or to choose the will of God. Uh, and so all of that was very important to the redemption story. Jesus had to stand where Adam stood 
on behalf of mankind to sin for him to do the right thing. So was he in a double mind? There is something called the humanity of Christ and the divinity of Christ. Christ as a human and Christ as God. And, and when he lived on earth, he lived largely as a human. And his humanity, he stood where we stand. He became like us, having to choose between what is right and what is the will of God. Uh, what is comfortable and what is uncomfortable. Um, and we all go through that when the will of God is so painful that you want something else. You, you want something that doesn't cost you so much. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus answered that question not only for himself, but for all of us. Uh, our faith, therefore, is not in our ability just to obey God by ourselves, but we trust in his obedience as acceptable before God. That doesn't mean we can live our lives haphazardly, but the grace we have before God is because Christ stood where we stood, confounded because of the conflict of a decision he has to make, the pain of what he had to choose, and still chose the will of God. And when we trust him for salvation, that is what we are saying. We are saying, Father, not my own will, but yours be done. As Christ was, so are we. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he's representing the human race in our conflict of choice between God's will and our own pleasure and, or our own desires. Very, very interesting. The tale of two gardens, the Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane. Pastor, you have a way with words. That is very interesting. Um, following on from the Garden of to the cross. We've gone through the, the chastisement, we've gone through the stripes. Let's go on to the cross itself. And at the point where he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27 and the verse 46. Had God really forsaken him? That's a very big theological question. Was there a point in that sequence of events where God forsook himself mm. in Christ. Right. Um, we have to interpret what Jesus said also in the light of where that scripture finds its first uh, occurrence in Psalm 22 and the sequence of events which went to talk about how he will be crucified and there will be nails in his hands and his garments will be sold and so on and so forth. So, did the father forsake the son? On a larger scale, no, because he was with him through death. But when Jesus took on the sin nature of mankind, he had to be separated as a human to pay that price and later present himself back to the Father as he told um, Mary, don't hold on to me, I have to present myself. So if he had to do that, then it presupposes that there was something about the relationship that had to be worked back in. Uh, so. I don't think that there was an eternal separation that God forsook him because if God forsook him, he wouldn't be resurrected. It was because God was with him that he was resurrected. But the sin nature, as sin does to all of us, it separates us from God. It, 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 and, and when we say sin has separated us from God, it doesn't mean God has abandoned us. If God abandons us, then we can never be saved. Uh, God never abandons us, but sin can separate us from God, although his love will never be separated from us, and we can never be abandoned from him. So Jesus, in his humanity, felt what we all feel when sin is, is placed on us, that we are distant from, from God, and, and that was the cry at that time. 
from the point of compassion, Sunday you said something that I found very heartwarming. And he said, don't ever mistake your anger against somebody for God's anger. He said, you may not like somebody, you may even hate the person, but God reaches out to that person and God shows his mercy and compassion. And today you're talking about the fact that on, on the cross, the sin nature came to the fore and, and did a separation, but God reaches out in love. It wasn't the sin nature of Jesus. The sin of the whole world was, was placed on him. On him. The Bible says he was made sin. He right. didn't commit sin. Uh, he didn't uh, act in a sinful way. Right. But he carried mm. sin. Right. And whilst he carried sin, sin did to him what sin does to everybody. Separate. It creates separation. Right. But you added on the love of God that reaches out to a person in the yes. time. And I think that was very, yeah. very significant. Yes. Um, you know, part of our background, especially African Christians, is that our religious worldview uh, deals with gods who are personal to us or personal to our families. So if you go to most families which are in idolatry, you find in front of their house is a god, is their personal family god. And so their god protects them from this other person's God uh, and can fight with the other person's right. God because it, it's a family God. And we take that concept sometimes into Christianity thinking that Jehovah is our family God or our personal God exclusive to us. Right. But Jesus said when we pray, we say, our Father who art in heaven, that God is not anybody's personal property exclusively. He is our personal father, but not exclusively yours to the neglect of somebody else. And so we cannot think that just because we hate somebody or we dislike somebody or somebody hurts us, God feels the same way about that person. Because lo God loves that person as much as he loves you. Because he's the God of all flesh, the God of all spirits. And, and, and our sense of ju justice and judgment sometimes forces us to wish that God would take sides with us against other people but uh, that's not the God of the Bible that can be your family God that op operates that way or your tribal God but the God of the Bible doesn't operate that way he loves all men and and and, and has mercy on, on all men love and mercy What's about you? So, Doc, still on the cross Jesus's last word it is finished mm. what was finished that's a very um, interesting uh, statement uh, rendered in the Greek as tetelestai, uh, depend on which verb you are using. Um, it was a phrase that was used in the times of Jesus uh, to mean that something is settled. It is settled. So finished there, it's like um, you owe an amount and you 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 go to pay the amount and then the accountant or cashier takes your receipt and stamps paid uh, it's finished it doesn't mean it is finished like ended but it is finished settled so when Jesus was on the cross and said it's settled he still did things after he died he, he the story continued even in his death up to his resurrection. But that statement he was make, making is publicly to the whole world. It's settled. First, it's settled because he is going to do it. He's paid the price. And he will see this through. It's settled. It's almost like you go to tell somebody about all your problems and, and all of that. And he says, listen, it's okay. It's settled. It doesn't mean at that time he has finished the process. It's, he's just telling you, as far as I'm concerned, it's done. And that's what Jesus was saying on the cross. As far as I'm concerned, this issue of Adam's sin and its effect on mankind, this issue of judgment for the human race because of one man's sin is settled. I have cleared it out of the way. And, and he becomes the redeemer. And all we need to do, the Bible says, is to believe in him and, and what he has done, and, and we have salvation. Salvation is free 
and it's totally by accepting that what Christ did, he did on our behalf. And we accept that to be true, we receive salvation. So between the, the death and the resurrection of Christ, I once heard you describe the chronology of events that happened, he descending to hell and the victory that was won. Could you walk us through the events between the death and the resurrection? The well, it, it, of them? it's part of the Christian creed. You know, uh, part of our discipline as, as a church in ICGC is we say the Christian creed. Uh, some people call it the Apostles' Creed. Uh, people don't always understand the development of Christian theology. Uh, and so when you see the Christian creed, some people think you are becoming Catholic, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the Christian creed is an established creed to affirm the most fundamental beliefs of the Christian faith. Yes. And part of it is that when Jesus died, he has descended to the place of death, or Sheol, hell. Not hell fire, but the place of death. Uh, there is enough scriptures to tell us that when he went to the place of death, he took the keys of death from the one who has all this time since Adam's time had the key, Satan. And not only that, he disarmed Satan. He made a public show of him. And, and as the old prophecy had said in the book of Genesis, he crushed the head of the serpent. And so all of these events took place. And on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday morning, he rose again, having totally vanquished Satan in his own domain in the place of death to give us the full victory that we have in him. So after he died physically, he continued to do battle and mm -hmm. complete the transaction of what will become our salvation. When you get that kind of perspective, our redemption, our salvation becomes more meaningful because of the understanding of what we have in Christ. Pastor Patrick. Doc, let me quote from one of your Easter Sunday sermons. Um, you said that the resurrection of Jesus was not a metaphor. It was a historical reality. How important is this reality um, of the resurrection to the Christian faith? The fact of the resurrection has been debated from the day one. Uh, the, the chief priests had to bribe the guards to tell a different story, no matter how uh, illogical that story was, that his disciples took his body. Disciples who were running away, who were afraid, will overcome a Roman guard. And a Roman guard is not one person. It will have probably be about 300 people uh, that will form a guard. A guard is a military detachment. And they were there, and, and these disciples would go and overcome a Roman guard, snatch his body, totally uh, illogical. Um, so it was debated from then. Uh, and people still debate. And the reason we debate is nobody dies and gets up, you know, and lives forever. It's, it's not human. But Jesus is not just human. He's God amongst us. So we cannot equate human stories with the story of Christ. We cannot say, this is how human beings have lived, and this is, must be how Jesus lived. Jesus is a unique one entity, never ever seen, never ever will be seen. Um, so how do we know the resurrection took place? I mean, we, we, somebody will say, well, all not there. But, you know, the disciples of Jesus s s preached it with a lot of confidence. And not only were they preaching with confidence, almost all of them who preached that message at the point of death affirmed that message. They were beheaded, they were burnt alive, they were cut into two, they were eaten by lions, they were gored by bulls, their families were killed in front of them, and none of them at any point said, oh, by the way, I think that resurrection story really is not true. Because how, why would people jeopardize themselves at this level if they felt what they believed was wrong? All they needed to do was recant, but they didn't recant. And throughout the ages, people have held their faith in the face of the most gruesome persecution. And the, the, the core of it is that Jesus died 
and Jesus rose again from the dead. Now, I am living 2,000 years away from that testimony. How can I trust something that happened? Yeah. I mean, if I read the story of Julius Caesar, I'm supposed to believe that there was a guy called Julius Caesar and so on and so forth, uh, although he lived earlier than Christ or, or Caesar Augustus or any of these historical figures. Where is the vouch? Who, who vouches for their story? For Jesus, there are people who died for that story. They died for the story. They, they believed in it so much and never recanted. And if you want proof of the historicity of the resurrection, it is the story of those men and women who saw something so real that they were ready to die for it. And remember, Jesus resurrected and showed himself to more than 500 people. So there were 500 eyewitnesses. This is not mass hallucination. This is individual encounters and mass encounters and group encounters. And all of them believed. And we have to also understand that the gospel accounts are very real. It tells us when people believe and when they don't believe. Even when Peter didn't believe, the gospel tells us Peter didn't believe. When the women told him, Thomas said, I cannot believe except I touch him. So you see the dynamics of humans who have been presented with a story that doesn't make human sense. And everybody doubting and struggling to come to faith that this thing has happened. And eventually seeing enough evidence by their interaction with him after the resurrection that he truly resurrected and dying for that. And that is how our faith can be deeply as anchored in Christ that Jesus who died rose again from the dead and that is the story the greatest story of humanity the greatest story of humanity if you just joined us this is time with Pastor Otabel helping us to find scriptural perspectives to some of the contemporary issues we discuss around the coffee tables of life on a day by day and week by week basis and today we are focusing on the passion and the resurrection of Christ and we are learning very important or receiving very important insights into the significance of various I, various events that happened along the line let me go back to the cross and to the fact that to his left and to his right were two condemned criminals was there any relevance to jesus dying between two thieves well the scriptures had said that will happen the prophets have declared that and so it had to happen um I, I think they represent humanity, although most of us would think we are not thieves, uh, but we are malevolent, we are sinners, uh, not because we broke a state law, but we broke God's law, we broke God's will. And Jesus was crucified right in the center of human sin. That's where he is, outside the city's gates of Jerusalem, publicly for all to see. Uh, it's interesting that although there are two thieves representing humanity and our fallenness and our sinfulness, one mocks him and one receives him, which is still the story now. All humans have fallen. Christ is presented to us. One part will mock him. The other part will receive him. And that's going to be the story of humanity. That there will be those who would say, who is he? He's nothing. And disparage him. And then there will be those who say, I'm stuck here. I can't save myself. Save me. Have mercy on me. And Jesus turns to the one who asks for uh, mercy and, and assures him of eternal life. So... Uh, we shouldn't be surprised that the message of the cross will always uh, be preached in the midst of mockers and believers, people who accept it and those who mock the message of the cross. I get a sense that what we face now also happened in the time of Christ because somebody who was watching, who knew probably um, how serious the offense the thief had committed was, would be surprised that Christ reached out in forgiveness to him at the time. And I can almost imagine somebody saying today, do you know what he or she did? How can you say just by saying, Lord, I surrender, they are forgiven? Is it as easy as that? Uh, I, I, you know, we, we, 
we always marvel at God's saving power and Christ's saving grace. The people he saves. He saves people we think shouldn't be saved. Right. <laughs> we think they're the most horrible people and he thinks they are good enough to be saved. Uh, and so the human race judges, that's why people judge church members. Oh, they are hypocrites. They are this and they are that. Do you know these people? Who are the, Look at all those sinners sitting in church. Who should come to Christ? He was crucified between sinners uh, and he redeemed them. Uh, and, and, and so we shouldn't marvel that people we think are unsavable, cannot be salvaged, are received by Christ. And, and yes, there, there will be people who mock and, and, and make fun of, of, of the salvation that is occurring right in front of them. So, so in John chapter 14, verse 19, Jesus says that because I live, you will live also. And um, in John chapter 10, verse 10, in, in John chapter 10, verse 10, he says that the thief comes not but to kill, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it in abundance. Um, but can you help us appreciate the, the victorious life of a believer through the resurrection of Christ? The, the, the life of the believer, when the life he gives us is his life. It's not our life. It's his life. It's the offer of his life to us. This is the, this, Jesus is the shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. He doesn't just protect the sheep, but he dies for the sheep in order to protect the sheep. So he offers us his life. The Christian life is living the life of Christ through his own grace, through the Holy Spirit, through his enablement. It is no use struggling to try and make it by yourself. It is trust in him. The life he gives us is life that he calls more abundant. That word or phrase more abundant means it's a qualitative life. It's a life of quality. You know, where is the quality? It is life that overcomes sin. It is life of righteousness. It is life that helps us to walk by faith. Uh, it is life that helps us to have peace in the midst of a storm. So when everybody's losing their head, we say, oh, God will do it. And people say, oh, you're not being realistic. You know? But that's the life of Christ. It's trusting him to take us through the valleys of life, through the storms of life. And that is part of the life that he gives to us. It's, it's an abundant life. It's uh, an effervescent life. It's life that is bubbly. It is life that is uh, expressive in confidence, in, in our calm assurance of who we are. And above all, it is life that guarantees us a future after death. Uh, to know that one day everybody is going to shut their eye in this uh, world. Uh, no matter how long you live, we will all survive uh, COVID-19. But sometime you would leave this earth. Uh, you would die. Um, not now, but sometime. What happens after that? And this life Jesus Christ gives us guarantees us that death is not the end. Just like death was not his end. That there is abundant life, there is eternal life, there is life with, with God the Father uh, in eternity. And, and for me, that is probably the most important life that he gives to us. Uh, because life here on earth no matter how long it is, it's very short. 100 years, 120 years, that's it. Uh, but eternity is, is a very long time. And to know that in eternity we are guaranteed a quality of life with the Father is something to be treasured and, and received. He's an author, he's a father, he's a grandfather, he's a pastor and a theologian. Wherever you are watching us on social media, just go on our comments page and tell me what is your biggest lesson from Pastor Table tonight in this very insightful discussion. I want to restrict myself to two things which I will pick from Pastor Table, the author, the titles of two books, Born to Die and The Tale of Two Gardens, The Garden of Eden and The Garden of Gethsemane. Pastor Patrick, what will be your one big takeaway from this discussion so far? Uh, my, my one big takeaway was a statement you made about the more abundantly that it is a qualitative life. Mm -hmm. It is not a life that is diminishing. It is a life that is qualitative. It is effervescent. Mm -hmm. 
So that is my one big takeaway from uh, a better tonight. Life. A better life. Wonderful. Jesus. Wonderful. Let's have your last question followed by my last question. Okay. Then we ask Pastor Tobo to give us his Easter message before we wrap up today. Galatians 3 verse 13 um, talks about Christ's death, that he redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for, for us. Now, he redeeming us from the curse of the law doesn't mean that no one can curse a believer. Um, it depends on what you call a curse. I, th there are causes and effects. Of course, if I go and stand on top of a building and jump down, it's cause and effect. When I jump down, I may be broken or die. If I go and uh, do something wrong, eat the wrong meal, uh, it will affect my body. If I don't watch my diet, it can affect me. Is that a curse? No, it's consequences, natural consequences. I suppose when people say a curse, they're talking about a spiritual attack initiated by another person against a believer. My view of my reading of the scripture and my understanding of the scripture that if a person is in Christ, redeemed by Christ, sealed by the Holy Spirit, no human being can curse him. Now, I can take time to give the theology behind it. I'm just summarizing the belief. Uh, but another time I can give you the theology behind it. But if a person is in Christ, washed by the blood of Jesus, sealed by the Holy Spirit, his life is hid with Christ in God, and he's seated in heavenly places in Christ. And another person, by whatever mechanism, is able to get that person. Uh, that is a little far-fetched from a New Testament point of view. Um, but people can do things and suffer consequences for, for it. And people can be scared into bringing some things upon themselves because fear has torment, the Bible says. So if, for example, you think a certain man of God has power to curse you and he says something, the fear of what he has said can torment you. It doesn't mean you've been cursed. It's just running away with fear. You've been tormented by your own fear. And, and, and God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. And, and based on that, we can walk confidently in what Christ has made us to be. Wow. What, a, what an amazing way to bring this point home. Pastor Otabel, before we go, in Philippians 3.10, Apostle Paul says, that I may know him. It would seem that the biggest gift we can give our audience in this week is to present Christ to them. So can we kindly request of you a prayer for anyone listening who says, this Jesus you talk about, can I come closer to him? Well, before I even pray, I mean, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. A man whose testimony is superlative. Um, he's walked with Christ, he has seen visions, he's been caught to the heavens. Um, Christ has appeared to him. He has written two-thirds of the New Testament. What more does Paul need? But his quest is still to know Christ. And, 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 the, and, and knowing Christ, the Bible calls it the unsearchable riches of Christ. In other, in other words, you never fully know him. It, and it's not knowledge, it's not information, it's encounter, it's intimacy, it's union with him, it's the reality of our relationship with him. And it must be our quest as Christians constantly to know him. And this uh, Passion Week, as we consider all that Christ did for us, I know you want to be healed, I know you want to prosper, I know you want... Uh, uh, money and uh, you want good things to happen to you and everybody wants something great to happen to them uh, but I hope that uh, today uh, and throughout this week we'll, we'll forget about COVID-19 and we'll forget about being locked down and we'll forget about uh, all the discomfort we're going through and all our pain and just for a moment say that I just want to know Christ and I want to grow in him and I want to serve him, and I want to love him, and I want him to manifest his life in me. I want to be like him. 
And, and if we make that our quest, as the Apostle Paul made his quest, then I believe that we can know him and experience the power of his resurrection. And I pray for each one of you that Christ will be made manifest to you, that he will make himself known to you, that he will open your eyes, your spiritual eyes, spiritual understanding, that you encounter him, that you know him beyond what you know about any man and, and know him in depth, in spirit and in truth and serve him and live for him and if necessary to die for him that his life may be manifested in your life, in my life, in our lives. And may the living Christ be made real to you in his name. Amen. 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 And wow. Amen. We thank God and we thank you, Pastor Otago, for these important insights as we have studied the passion and the resurrection of Christ. Well, this is the moment where we would ask you to demonstrate your love for Christ with your giving. So we'll take a message from the church and while that message is being played, you will get the opportunity to show your love for Christ with your giving. Your giving is a part of your worship, your interaction with God, a demonstration of your love and appreciation for God. So go ahead and give using the various channels expressed in the communication that will follow this. When I come back, I'm going to ask Pastor Tebo to give the whole nation and the world at large his Easter message. Please don't go away. Be inspired every morning with Word to Go by Pastor Mensa Otterville. It's online on my ICGC app, Facebook, and YouTube at Mensa Otterville and at ICGC Christ at 5.30 a.m. Word to Go is also now on TV3 at 5.30 a.m. and on partner media platforms at scheduled times. Time with Pastor Mensa Otterville now airs thrice a week. On our various online platforms, make a date on every Thursday at 6 p.m. and again at 8 p.m. and on Saturdays at 6 p.m. Find us at Mensa Automobile and at ICGC Christ. We're also on TV3 on Sundays at 6 p.m. and partner media platforms at various scheduled times. Be blessed by the Living Word broadcast every weekday at 12.35 p.m. on Joy FM and at scheduled times on partner media platforms. Tonight we've been discussing the passion and the resurrection of Christ and it's been for me a very insightful time of learning and of inquiring about what the scripture says. Uh, before we go, Pastor Patrick, this is our third session. Having done the Christian response to COVID-19 in last week, navigating moments of uncertainty. For somebody who says, this is my first time, I didn't know you've been having such a wonderful series. How can they find back editions and enjoy it with their family and their loved ones? Okay, so if you missed our previous sessions with um, Dr. Otabel, you can go on YouTube right now and um, search for Mensa Otabel or Christ Temple and subscribe to the channels. Now, the, the, the sessions have been uploaded there for you to play on demand. You can also look for Mensa Otabel's podcast um, on, on iOS or on Android. Look for Mensa Otabel podcast. Subscribe to it as well and the message will be there to play on demand and also to download for your playlist as you go on um, um, throughout the week. Pastor Otabel, give us a benediction today. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all now and forevermore. The Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace, both now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.